Okay, we're talking with David Wasdell today. He's a climate scientist on the forefront of global warming, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, the feedback mechanisms which are causing global warming to happen at a far faster rate than scientists have previously thought. Uh, can you run down a little bit how global warming works? Yes, why don't we start with the real basics here? I mean, the, the Earth hangs in space, and space is exceptionally cold. It exists at about minus 272 and a bit degrees centigrade. Very, very cold environment. And within that context, the planet Earth hangs in all its complex beauty. The Earth itself is a, what I would call a second-generation artifact of cosmic evolution. In other words, what makes the Earth the Earth has already passed through the furnace of a star death already. And so the Earth has become a sort of aggregated sphere of spatial debris, quite a lot of it radioactive. And uh, Earth's oceans and crust float on a molten mantle and inner core that is actually heated right at its heart by radioactive decay. So the Earth is a source of heat in its own right. So it hangs there in space as a hot body radiating heat. But it's got a duvet around it. It's got an atmosphere around it. It's insulated by this, and that slows the rate of cooling and keeps the Earth hotter for longer. And of course, the Earth isn't alone in space either, because the sun brings an enormous amount of energy onto the surface of the Earth. And uh, that energy is trapped by the greenhouse gas effect. So let me explain that a bit more. Light energy from the sun comes in at very uh, short wavelength, as light energy. That penetrates the atmosphere and gets down to the surface of the Earth. That heats up the Earth, and the heat gets re-radiated back out as infrared, low wavelength, um, longer wavelength energy. Now, what we call greenhouse gases, like carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, actually stop that infrared energy getting back out into space. So sunlight comes in, transforms to heat, that goes out somewhere through the atmosphere and gets blocked. And the more greenhouse gas there is in the atmosphere, the more of that energy gets blocked and the hotter the surface of the Earth is kept. It's actually kept us able to sustain life over billions of years. Without it, we would be dead. Now that's, if you like, the heart of the greenhouse effect. The Earth radiates as much energy as it receives. So the temperature of the surface of the Earth gets to the stage that through the duvet, if you like, goes out as much energy as the sun pours in. What we've done is added tog to that duvet. We've increased the effectiveness of the uh, insulating mantle around the Earth. So we're trapping more heat near the surface and not letting anywhere near as much get back out into space. While that's happening, temperatures start to go up. They go up very slowly because the Earth takes a long time to heat. So we've increased, if you like, the engine of heating by increasing greenhouse gases. And what we're just beginning to see now is the result of that in the increased temperature. It hasn't gone up much, but what's in the pipeline over the next 50 or 60 years from what we've already put into the atmosphere is a lot more heat than we were already seeing. And what we're seeing is a lot more than we thought we were going to see. And that's the sort of beginner's start here on global warming and the greenhouse effect. Shall I go on now to look at the, uh, the sort of issues that I actually presented in this seminar that I've just been to? Well, let's, uh, let's take a look at that seminar. We meet at a time in which the complex adaptive systems of planet Earth are facing the impingement of a species whose population explosion, exponential resource use, accelerating technological development, unrestrained pollution and dysfunctional behavior have combined to overstep the conditions of sustainability. It is the argument of this presentation that we have reached a tipping point or bifurcation in the Earth system as a whole. That's different from the, the chattering or subsystem tipping points that we've seen being referred to elsewhere. The navigation of this bifurcation 
sets the initial conditions, not just for the next millennium, but for the future of life on Earth. So, what is a bifurcation? Well, Brian Walker, the Australian founder of the Resilience Alliance, offers this landscape. The ridgetop line here marks the tipping point between the basins of complex equilibria, basin one, basin two. As negative feedbacks yield to positive feedback, system behavior moves up to the ridge, leaves its familiar stability before plunging into the containment of an alternative state. So the issue of feedback threshold, then, is now the most critical agenda of research. It has urgent implications for current strategic decision making and indeed for the whole world community. It is therefore to the conceptual analysis of that global level that we must now turn our attention as a first step in exploring the possible existence of a tipping point of bifurcation in the macro system itself. We start simple, build up. So we begin by assembling the basic elements that drive climate change. Global geothermal heating, the radioactive driven decay in energy, is added for completeness, though its, its order is much smaller than the other issues involved. So in practice, we can ignore it in the analysis. Increase in CO2 emissions, methane concentration, drive global heating, which leads to rising temperature. Then we can add in other anthropogenic greenhouse gases, increase in concentration of water vapor, and then vapor trails, particulate aerosols, albedo effects, and finally, the complex contribution of cloud systems. That completes the set of drivers of climate change. Taken together, the elements drive radiative forcing away from equilibrium, so generating global heating, which in turn leads to increase in average global temperature, albeit subject to complex subsystem energy distribution dynamics, endothermic damping, thermal inertia, and consequential time delays. That's the standard model of climate change. Interacting with that model are the accelerating effects of feedback dynamics to which we now turn. Six major categories of feedback process can now be identified in addition to the geothermal feedback, which, as I said, is of a lower order of significance. Nonlinear relationships link the feedback drivers and their target systems. For instance, F1 down there is driven by increased carbon dioxide concentration and drives increase in carbon dioxide concentration. So that is a positive linked feedback loop. There are several items within each of these categories. All other feedback categories are driven by rise in temperature and therefore only come into action as greenhouse gas-driven global heating begins to take effect. We can then complete the conceptual analysis by overlaying the complex adaptive feedback system on the standard climate change model. We have no time this morning to look at the various subsystems, categories of feedback and specific feedback mechanisms those who are interested can explore the material in depth on the Meridian website, access to which you will find in the handout. This particular slide is full of um, active links so that we can look at categories, we can explore feedbacks, we can extrapolate those into different mechanisms, we can bring out subsystems and explore their feedback dynamics and so on. Today, that is a given slide. The background work is for later. Now, feedbacks not only affect the specific functions on which they operate, their output also changes the driver conditions for other feedbacks, which in turn reinforce the driver of the initial mechanism. So nearly all the system, systems known to affect climate change are now in positive feedback. Each feedback mechanism accelerates its own specific process but as a whole, the complex adaptive system consists of an interactive set of mutually reinforcing subsystems. And this accelerates the acceleration of climate change. It therefore constitutes a second order 
feedback system. The inclusion of the complex feedback system in our study of the cumulative effects of greenhouse gas emissions leads to a fundamental shift in our understanding of the dynamics of climate change. The development calls in question the inadequate assumptions underlying all current strategic approaches to the control of global warming. It is as significant as the original recognition that human emissions from the combustion of fossil fuels could in fact lead to potentially dangerous levels of climate change. Our world climate responds as a complex adaptive system in which small interventions, greenhouse gas emissions, can precipitate large non-linear effects with long time delays. So much for the model. Let's look at its behavior over time. We should focus particularly on its system's dynamics, its equilibrium states, its tipping points. And then I'll go on to build a topological landscape on which the crossroads facing planet Earth can be more clearly seen. Um, George, you recognize, I think, the origins of this one. Uh, from William Rodiman's paper that you published some time ago, cores drilled in the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets have provided evidence about the Earth's past climate, including changes in the concentrations of greenhouse gases. This is the three-kilometer-long ice core retrieved from Vostok during the 1990s. It's been expanded since then. Confirmed that concentrations of CO2 and methane rose and fell in a regular pattern. We're familiar with this over virtually all of the past 400,000 years. I put this up just to indicate how profoundly in sync these increases and decreases in greenhouse gases were with the intervals in the intensity of received solar radiation. The uh, Nankiewicz cycles, of course. However, changes in global heating or cooling were significantly greater than the small fluctuations in energy arriving from the sun due to the precession tilt and wobble in the Earth orbit. Why? Well, small changes in received solar energy triggered weak positive feedback in the Earth system, whether of heating or cooling. Um, I'm going to put a bracket in here because I think this is too good to pass by. Here is the chatter of the last two ice ages that, that Bill has been talking about, that the pump driving brain development and the pump driving populations out of Africa, the shift between the warm, wet, and the cold, dry wind is often set off by the thermohaline switch. Okay. We talked about weak, positive feedback in the Earth's system, whether of heating or cooling. This amplified the effect of change in solar heating. Cyclical changes in global temperature are the combined result, therefore, of shifts in received solar energy and their amplification by the changing greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gas production and resulting changes in concentration of atmospheric greenhouse gases constitute an inherently unstable equilibrium. From its tipping point here, increase in solar heating sets off runaway global warming. Conversely, from the same tipping point, decrease in solar heating sets off runaway global cooling. This unstable equilibrium is contained by the changes in solar heating. So as energy received from the sun starts to decrease after reaching its maximum, it provides a more powerful negative feedback that halts and reverses the weaker positive feedback of the biosphere. Runaway global warming is stopped and reversed. Similarly, at the other end of the cycle over there, as energy received from the sun starts to increase after reaching its minimum, it again provides a more, positive, a more powerful negative feedback that halts and reverses the weaker positive feedback of the biosphere. Runaway global cooling is stopped and reversed. The combined effect of these two interacting features results in the stable equilibrium of the illustration. This analysis alerts us to one very significant proviso. Should any intervention occur in this system that neutralizes the damping effect of changes in received solar radiation, 
then the underlying unstable equilibrium of the biosphere would be exposed without containment. Runaway climate change would proceed without further control. It is precisely such an intervention that has been initiated by the Industrial Revolution. As the only Brit present, I have to take full responsibility. <laughs> Oh, that's my guilt trip out of the way. Good. The impact of extreme events, however, illustrates limits to the stable equilibrium. On more than one occasion, cooling feedbacks, feedback loops overwhelmed the homeostasis, precipitating the snowball earth effect. That's going down into this side of it. Slow degrade in the feedback process led to an eventual recovery of the base equilibrium. On the other side, Massive release of CO2 as a result of major volcanic activity in the Siberian region, for instance, also overwhelmed the homeostasis, set off positive feedback loops, precipitating runaway global warming and eliminating most life forms, for instance, at the end of the Permian, the Permian-Jurassic interface. Now, that central homeostasis controlled by the damping effects of the negative feedback loops, when disturbed beyond a given range, is subject to increasingly powerful positive feedback processes, pushing it towards the peak of the unstable equilibrium. And it is at that point, there for warming and there for cooling, that the negative and positive feedbacks just balance each other. As positive feedback loops begin to dominate post-industrial revolution, they move the system beyond the unstable point into accelerating change. That's a bit repetitive, but I really want to make that point very clear. Let's widen the perspective some. These extreme responses are themselves subject to boundaries, so and so, creating a wider form of equilibrium, the maintenance of which has enabled the evolution and maintenance of life on this planet, in contrast, of course, to conditions on Venus. Eventually, a new equilibrium is achieved, warming, cooling, at some distance from the base position. And in these extreme conditions, the environment is very hostile to most life forms. The biosphere takes many millions of years to recover once the system has returned to the central equilibrium. Five major extinction events have occurred in geological history. Humanity may have just triggered the six. I include this other slide of William Ruddiman's work because it shows more recent onset of the current warm interglacial period. It's a smaller scale, obviously. Current orbital analysis, however, indicates that we are entering an anomalous 30 to 50,000 year extension of the current warm interglacial period and not starting the descent into the next ice age as he had previously assumed. Now, human emissions of greenhouse gases began to accumulate in the atmosphere about 8,000 years ago with the onset of agriculture and deforestation. By the start of the Industrial Revolution, the resultant global warming of about 0.8 degrees centigrade had almost exactly compensated for the small amount of expected cooling. Since the start of the Industrial Revolution and the accelerating oxidation of deposits of fossil biomass, the rate of accumulation of atmospheric greenhouse gases has speeded up dramatically. The time scale, although appearing slow in relationship to the individual human lifespan, is some 100 times faster than the geological perturbations of the basic equilibrium. That means that adaptation in the natural systems is extremely difficult. Furthermore, both time frame and scale of the change have much more in common with the extreme events which led to the historical overwhelming of the stable equilibrium. As emissions soared, so the cumulative concentration of atmospheric, atmospheric CO2 began to rise from its pre-industrial base of 282 parts per million, which we left somewhere around 1840-ish, accelerating through the current figure now at 381 and rising by just over 2 parts per million per year, towards its projected value of some 550 parts per million by 2050. That's unless some significant action is taken meanwhile. Global warming, the temperature, has slowly followed suit, but with significant time delay, about 60 to 80 years, probably. Since the atmosphere and oceans can take decades to adjust to reach new temperatures, it's also masked, incidentally, by industrial aerosols, damped by endothermic processes. It takes a lot of energy to melt ice. 
or to evaporate water. And temperature increase seen today probably represents the global warming due to CO2 levels of equivalent to the 1930s levels. So this is one of the most disinformative slides I've ever seen. It tries to get the scales to match and show that this level of temperature actually correlates with this level of CO2. It doesn't. It's more likely correlating with, with levels of CO2 down about here. So how we present information can be used to massage public opinion. I want to look a bit more at radiative forcing. Accumulating greenhouse gases have driven radiative forcing away from equilibrium. See, when the effects of CO2 equivalent emissions, that's the other greenhouse gases that we produce, are added in to the CO2, then the greenhouse gas concentration now stands at just over 420 parts per million, which is above the level set by the European agencies as the ceiling beyond which we should not go if we are to limit global warming to about two degrees and avoid dangerous climate change. We've passed it. And it's not just a level, but the rate at which we are passing it is accelerating. In geological time, well, let's could just go back to that event. You see, watts per square meter of radiative forcing is looking here at a carbon dioxide concentration of about 360. We are now at 381, which is about here. If you add in the other greenhouse gases, we're about here. So watts per square meter forcing is probably 2 to 2.4, not the 1.5 as on this graph. In geological time, apart from the extreme events, thermal equilibrium of the whole Earth system was sustained. Radiative forcing stayed close to zero. It's down this sort of area. The pace and scale of anthropogenic intervention is accelerating radiative forcing away from equilibrium. It is under these conditions that the effects of positive feedback loops in the process must now be taken into account. And do please remember that most of the climate modeling supercomputer runs work best very close to equilibrium. The further we get away from equilibrium, the worse their capacity to deal with feedback processes become. In our current situation, Increased concentration of greenhouse gases driven by accumulation from human emissions and magnified by the accelerating effect of the set of positive feedback loops is widening the gap between received and emitted energy. Instead of moving naturally towards a restored equilibrium, coming back to here, the radiative forcing is accelerating indeed. Its rate of acceleration is increasing. So let's explore. What kind of intervention strategy is required to restabilize the equilibrium? Well, survival of life on Earth requires the restabilizing of geosolar thermal equilibrium at a temperature close enough to the maximum of the warm interglacial periods. As an intervention, that entails the slowing, halting, and reversing of the increase in global heating, followed by a sustained period of global cooling with negative radiative forcing. Eventually, global heating would then need to stabilize close to zero again, with the temperature held roughly constant at the new and acceptable thermal equilibrium. The effective achievement of such a strategic intervention would only be possible if and while the capacity to reduce greenhouse gas concentration outweighed the combined and time-delayed power of the set of positive feedback mechanisms. If those criteria were not met, we would face uncontrollable runaway climate change for the foreseeable future with catastrophic consequences. Different feedback categories require different intervention strategies. So the very first set, the ones that are driven by increasing concentration of CO2 and in turn raise concentration of CO2, um, they can drive global heating in a feedback positive mode. But they can be neutralized by stabilizing the CO2 concentration. That's not stabilizing emissions, it's stabilizing concentration. That requires reduction in CO2 emissions to a rate that can be totally absorbed by the environment. And the rate of absorption is degrading as global pollution and other systems go forward. <coughs> 
So we have a downward slope on what is containable. The second set of hybrid loops is driven by rising temperature but results in increasing CO2 concentration. Since there's a significant time delay in the stabilizing of global temperature for any given CO2 concentration, these loops would continue to be active after the point at which the first set had been neutralized. Rising temperature would therefore lead to increased CO2 concentration. That, in turn, would reactivate the first set of feedback loops, which are themselves depending on rising CO2 concentration. So that neutralizing of this particular process would depend on significant further reductions in emissions during the period while temperature rise continues and before it has been halted. Five, six, seven decades? More? The third set of feedback loops is temperature driven and independent of the CO2 emission cycle. These continue to drive temperature upwards for as long as temperature is actually increasing. They also set off mechanisms of global heating which are themselves subject to long time delays in reaching their full effect. The albedo effect, the increase in water vapor concentration, the release of methane from thawing permafrost, and eventually the release of methane from the clathrate, depo uh, de clathrate deposits in the shallow ocean areas around the, the, the continents. These are the most positive and powerful feedback loops driving the acceleration of global heating. In simple language, the hotter it gets, the hotter it gets, tiddly pom. Winnie the Pooh has an enormous amount to say on climate change, for those of you who, who read your classics. Um, you see, this set of feedback loops sets in motion an uncontrollable chain reaction with a long built-in time delay. And containment of this set of positive feedback loops and their transformation into a containing negative feedback process requires a dramatic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions at the earliest possible point in order to ensure the lowest possible peak of the temperature trajectory. And it is not clear whether that window of opportunity is still open. It is therefore imperative to explore the limits of our power to intervene in the complex feedback system. I find this a difficult one to work with and to explain. On the vertical axis, we map the relative power of the negative or damping intervention of reducing CO, uh, CO2 emissions. And we compare it to the effect of the positive change accelerating feedback processes represented by the yellow area. So at the origin, down here, when greenhouse gas concentration was still virtually undisturbed and environmental absorption of emissions could still handle all we produced, power to contain system disturbance by reducing emissions is total. No problem. As emissions start to exceed environmental reabsorption capacity, greenhouse gas concentration starts to rise. That sets in train eventual time-delayed response of the temperature disturbance. By the time global warming became detectable, positive change reinforcing feedback loops had already started to play their part. As global heating continued to rise, the power to make a difference in the feedback balance by reducing emissions starts to decline. Eventually, positive feedback process takes control and, the and all further effect of emissions reduction is nullified. The critical heating threshold at which this takes place represents the closing of that window of opportunity during which human initiatives to generate negative system damping interventions are still able to halt global warming and return it to a stable, life-sustaining equilibrium. You know, the stark implications of that last section are made even clearer if we express the power of the positive feedback system as a fraction of the power of the controlling intervention system. So again, while global heating remains close to the original equilibrium, the value of the, ratio, of, the, of the ratio is virtually zero. Influence of the positive feedback loops is minimal, and the situation is consistent with the assumptions of current strategic thinking. 
As global heating starts to rise, the relative power of positive feedback system begins to climb. The capacity to intervene by reducing greenhouse gas emissions quickly decays. The more powerful the positive feedback loops become, the more massive and costly is the intervention needed to return the system to equilibrium. As the energy exchange approaches the critical threshold, the power ratio between positive feedback and controlling intervention and the total cost of making any effective intervention reaches a vertical asymptote. In other words, it approaches infinity. Beyond that critical threshold in global heating, there is no further intervention capable of damping the system. The runaway chain, of re chain reaction of uncontrollable climate change will have been initiated, leading inevitably to the sixth or Anthropocene extinction event. I find this very hard material to put together and even harder to present, but never mind, let's keep going. Hope and fear, by the way, are not two words that I use very much. For me as a scientist, reality is more important than manipulating public opinion, either by use of terror or unrealistic hope. Our task is to understand what is happening and then to enable the communication of scientific reality. Even if for some people that generates fear and despair, we then have to work that through. Unrealistic hope also leads to unrealistic action. What we require is the capacity to engage reality and work at the implications. Current strategies, you see, assume no limit to the time scale within which it is still possible to intervene effectively. They also deny any degrade in the ability of emissions reduction to control the rate of global heating, however high it becomes. In so doing, they gravely underestimate the power of positive feedback. These are false assumptions, and they place the future of our world in extreme danger. So we're now ready to combine the equilibrium topology surface with the critical threshold graph in a single diagram. Pre-industrial accumulation of human-generated greenhouse gases just cancelled out the natural damping negative feedback system, leaving the Earth in balance, uh, Pache Al Gore, in a condition of unstable equilibrium. This has something to do with the American ele electoral system, I think. Um, exponential increase in greenhouse gas concentration driven by the Industrial Revolution, then tipped the system over the hill and into the present state of accelerating climate change. The effects of human-generated emissions were amplified by an increasingly powerful set of positive feedback mechanisms, the behavior of which is driven both by increase in CO2 concentration and by the time-dependent effects of temperature change, summarizing what we've just been saying. The further we move away from the position of unstable equilibrium, the more powerful the positive feedback system becomes and the faster is the resultant rate of climate change. The vertical asymptote of the critical threshold now rises through the downslope beyond the peak of the unstable equilibrium. And the window of opportunity within which reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is able to contain the process of global heating and return the system to equilibrium lies to the left of that critical threshold. It is not yet clear how close to that threshold we are in reality, or whether in fact it has already been passed. Loss of power to intervene in the system becomes absolute as the asymptote is approached, and the closer we come to the threshold, the more massive and costly the required intervention becomes. So now let's introduce the dimension of time, running from left to right along the base axis here. We can then extrapolate the lines of the previous diagram as surfaces going through time within the volume of the resultant three-dimensional space. The equilibrium topology is now represented by the ridge stretching from left to right. Near to the front face is the green valley area of the stable equilibrium. The surface rises from the valley through the infection line where the positive feedback loops begin to influ influence the system, then climbs on up to the unstable equilibrium or tipping line at the summit of the ridge, where positive and negative feedback processes just cancel each other out. Over the hill, the positive feedback loops are dominant and drive runaway global heating and resultant climate change. That's the summary transferred into three dimensions. The vertical asymptotic wall of the critical threshold reaches up through the downward slope on the far side of the ridge. 
Mm -hmm. It contains the area within which reduction of greenhouse gas emissions still constitutes an effective intervention able to return the system to a stable equilibrium. As that wall is approached, the power of the intervention decreases rapidly and reduction in emissions required to stabilize the system becomes massive and costly. Now, inactivity is not neutral. Every passing year reduces further the window of opportunity within which it is still possible to avoid the chain reaction of uncontrollable runaway climate change. We are now in the early stages of an extreme disturbance of global climate. There is no naturally occurring negative feedback process in place to contain its effects. Dennis Meadows said, what we have to do is find new negative feedback mechanisms. I said, they're not out there to be found. We actually have to generate them in our own human activity. So strategically, the only option open to us is the replacement of the neutralized damping effect of reduction in received solar energy with an intervention of our own making of sufficient power to overcome the now active positive feedback process. So today, we are facing a bifurcation in the whole Earth system that places the crossroads for planet Earth in a new and critical context. Without effective action, we will trigger the Anthropocene extinction event. If we look down, can you do this? Look down on the landscape and flatten it out a bit. You see that four ways meet at the present crossroads. The facticity of our historic journey opens into three choices. The business as usual path stretches downwards on the steepening slope, passes through the asymptotic wall of the critical threshold, and descends ever further into the veil of positive feedback, the landscape of runaway climate change. The current Kyoto strategy, aimed at slow reduction in the rate of increase in greenhouse gas emission, or eventually decrease in the volume of emissions themselves, even if successful, does not reduce greenhouse gas concentration. It merely reduces the rate at which greenhouse gas concentration rises. Global heating continues to increase, albeit at a somewhat reduced rate. Positive feedback processes, particularly the temperature-sensitive ones, are not deactivated, but slightly damped. The projected path through the equilibrium landscape deviates slightly to the right. The descent is slowed, but continues, nevertheless, down the slope, away from the ridge, past the critical threshold, and into the domain of runaway climate change. The survival pathway is the only intervention that can halt that descent, turn it along the contour line, and then make it climb slowly back up and over the ridge. It requires a strategy of sustained reduction in greenhouse gas concentration, stabilizing and reducing the rate of global heating, initiating a period of global cooling, and that scenario would have to be held in place. Whatever positive feedback loops were activated in the long period before the rise in global temperature was halted, reversed, and brought into constant stable equilibrium. The sharper and faster the intervention is affected, the more hope, realistic hope, we have of averting an otherwise inevitable climate catastrophe of our own making, the Anthropocene extinction event. We cannot afford any further delay in effective action. Any procrastination increasingly risks global bankruptcy in financing the needed intervention and massive human suffering in carrying it through to completion. It also threatens our ability to regain control before the system is overwhelmed by positive feedback and drifts into the runaway global warming. 
to allow powerful vested interests of the social, economic, and political systems to continue to hijack the world and hold it to ransom for the sake of short-term profit, political power, and national protectionism would be an act of collective suicide. A lot of people uh, saw that movie the day after, you know, and they thought yeah. that, you know, all of a sudden this, we're going to change into an ice age. Are we going to really go into an ice age, or w what does that really mean? I think the, the day after probably needs a day that lasts about 60,000 years. Um, there's three sort of levels of climate change, if you like. There's a fairly slow, incremental, smooth climate change where we put some CO2 up into the atmosphere and there's going to be some warming. And we can adapt to that. There'll be bits of drought here and there and so on. But it's a fairly steady, a little bit of rise in sea levels and slowly happening but with enough capacity to adapt and enough technologies to cope. That's the scenario that most people have been looking at and that's what's been governing national strategies and so on over the last few decades decade and a half. That's slow, smooth, and fairly small. What we're now seeing is the capacity for even that amount of global warming to flip the Gulf Stream and its driving currents into a different mode of operation. Basically, the warmer it gets, the more it rains in the North Atlantic, so the less salty the water gets. The more ice melts, the more fresh water is released into the North Atlantic, so the less salty it gets. And as the Greenland ice cap begins to discharge, discharge ice, that also means icebergs melting in the North Atlantic. And that also increases the uh, desalination. And the less salty the water gets, and the warmer the water gets, the less that water sinks down to the bottom of the sea and drives back towards the tropics, displacing the warm water, which is the Gulf Stream, up towards northern Europe. Now, when that surface water reaches a certain level of unsaltiness, it doesn't sink anymore. So the cold salt water isn't going back down towards the tropics. So the warm tropical water isn't coming up north towards Europe. And that can change over a period of three, five, ten years once it starts to flip. We know already that the great whirlpools of sinking water have decreased in their energy by about 25%. We know that the Gulf Stream flow rates coming up towards Europe are also slowing. But we don't know when the actual switch mechanism turns off. If it does, we're probably going to see a drop of temperature of around 4 or 5 degrees across Western Europe and the areas affected by it's the Gulf Stream. Centigrade. Centigrade, yes. Yes, I'm So sorry, that's about, what, 10 degrees about Fahrenheit? About that, isn't it, roughly. That's quite a shift. We're also seeing 2 or 3 degrees centigrade shift upwards because of global warming. So to some extent it buffers. What we're not going to see is a huge ice side flip, flipped by this. The problem is, if we switch off the thermohaline currents, as they're called, the, the great salty temperature-driven um, drivers of the Gulf Stream, it has a lot of knock-on effects. There's a lot of drying out of atmosphere. Drought areas are set up across the world. Wind speeds increase. That increases dust storming. Um, you're going to find desert expansion, destruction of food-producing areas. It's a major, major catastrophe in its own right. So that's the next level. Small, smooth changes, Gulf Stream flip. That's a big one, but it's not a massive disaster. It will put huge stress on social systems globally and be very difficult to adapt to. It may already be irreversibly in the pipeline. That comes up under adaptation. The next level in climate change is the shift between what we call ice ages, where you know, half of the northern hemisphere is covered in ice sheets, and the interglacial warm periods, which is one, one of which is where we are now. Now that's a big shift. The switching off of the Gulf Stream is not going to precipitate that. 
Um, it could take us down four or five degrees, but it won't precipitate an ice age. A lot of the heat that was being drawn up towards the polar regions stays somewhere else, and you get much warmer seas in the tropical areas because the heat just isn't going towards the poles. That means higher storm energies and more Katrinas, um, but it doesn't mean the day after tomorrow, right? The major problem that I've outlined in my seminar presentation is that we have put so much CO2 into the atmosphere that we've set off not just a lot of heating and possible instabilities, but a feedback dynamic that threatens one of the major extinction events. And that means instead of uh, having to adapt to a, yes, a, a very difficult scenario with the switching down of the thermohaline currents, we're going to be facing wiping out of 80, 90 percent of life on Earth. Life basically becomes uninhabitable. There will be a few surviving species in niche areas, um, but it is a catastrophe that we would not survive as a civilization. It could take several million years for the biosphere to recover. What's, what's going to cause the extinction? All right, let me tell you. The main threat is that the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere sets the Earth up on a heating program that can't be stopped. The hotter it gets, the more water vapor gets into the atmosphere, and water vapor is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. So the hotter it gets, the more water vapor in the atmosphere, the more water vapor in the atmosphere, the hotter it gets. With ice melt, we reflect back a lot less energy into space, so we get hotter, so we melt more ice, so we get hotter, so we melt more ice. And with all these mechanisms working together, we begin to thaw the permafrost, we release methane, that makes it hotter. The hotter it gets, we heat up the local areas of shallow sea. As the hot water in the surfaces of shallow sea reaches down to the bottom of the shallow sea, that can release massive amounts of methane, which are stored there in crystalline, frozen form. And when that starts to bubble up, methane is 24 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And we get runaway uh, increase of um, infrared storage at the Earth's surface. So you can see a, a shift of average temperatures of 10, 15 degrees centigrade. And that means in the polar and northern regions, 20, 25 degrees centigrade shift. And that's good by most viable life systems. We don't want to go that way. We still have the capacity to stop that happening, but we can't mess around with the procrastination that we've been engaging now. We can no longer allow vested interests to try and cut out climate science because it might hurt, hurt the, the, the bottom line of a few powerful companies or political systems. We now have to start working together as a global civilization to enable the survival of life on this small spaceship Earth. Houston, we have a problem. If we're going to get this one back on time and online, we have an enormous amount of work to do. It's possible, but only if we work together. Uh, James Levlock, you know, the inventor of the Gaia Principle, Mm. Uh, recently uh, released a paper saying that at this point it's probably we're beyond the capacity to actually reduce our uh, CO2 levels even if we could get the, the politicians in line you know enough to where we're going to be able to turn around this mm -hmm. uh, catastrophe he says we're going to have to build machines you know to suck the carbon dioxide out and uh, from what you're saying that's just the first step you know we well, have more things to do. Can you kind of outline yeah, what... Yeah, uh, I can indeed. Uh, and, and let me be a, say a little bit about James Lovelock's book. It's a lovely book, but he's, there are bits in it that are quite rambly as well. James talks about getting beyond the tipping point, beyond the point of no return in that book, which is scary language. What he means there is that we've gone beyond the point where we have the capacity to stop any climate change. Some of it's going to happen. It could get quite bad. What we haven't gone beyond the point 
is the ability to stop the ultimate catastrophe happening. That's really important to keep in mind. Otherwise, his book puts you in despair. So we have realistic hope still of being able to keep this on track. There will be big impacts, but we can survive them. Now, in terms of what we have to do, it looks like we have to reduce carbon dioxide concentrations below their current level and get them back down from around the 380 to 400 parts per million level to something like 300. That over quite a time. The first step is to stop any further increase in carbon dioxide concentration. That means we have to reduce emissions globally below the level that the global commons can absorb them. That stabilizes the situation, first step. Now, the technology to do that is available. The will to do it must come from our understanding of the catastrophe we face if we don't do it. We can actually get to that point. We then have the very difficult period of 60, 70 years once we've stabilized and started to reduce greenhouse gas levels, where temperature goes on rising because of what we've already done. That's the real danger zone. Now, in that time, we may have to go on sucking out greenhouse gases by all means available. Mm -hmm. Going to a, Well, let's go look at it practically. You can move from a, say, reduction of 80% of greenhouse gas emissions to a zero carbon economy. It's survivable. It means a different lifestyle. It means a whole different value system for our world civilization, but it's possible. And the, the higher levels of technology we bring to bear on that, the better, because we can do it faster. And there are all sorts of things in the pipeline that can help. There are also what we call sequestration techniques. That's not just burying the carbon dioxide that is being produced by the way we create energy and, and electricity. That's the technology we have. But actually taking out of the atmosphere, using calcium hydroxide arrays and so on, significant amounts of greenhouse gas that are already there. The technology to do that is designed. It could be deployed on a scale large enough to make a significant difference. What, what, what kind of an effort would that take? How much would it cost? I don't know. Hmm. And at the moment, frankly, the bottom line is the, is the last of my worries. That will send people's ha hackles up, I know. But you know, you know that stage, that, that phrase, it's the, it's the economy stupid. Well, this is going to turn it round because it's the ecology stupid, because the, the economy depends on having a viable biosphere in which to live and make our living. We have to get that right, whatever it costs. And if we don't, cost is irrelevant. So let's get priorities right. We have to deal with this is the priority system. Um, but I'm sorry, I can't give you the costings on this at the moment. They are being looked at, and by the time we need them, they'll be clear. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, and I think this is probably the most important intervention possible, I, I said the danger zone is while temperature is still rising, once we've already brought the CO2 levels under control. Now, there are ways of setting off what they call cloud-producing aerosols, little particles of salt and, uh, from evaporated seawater by spinning off very tiny droplets, but masses of them, from ships designed to do it. They can be robot ships. They don't even have to be manned. They tack up and down in the trade wind areas of the tropics, spewing out cloud-producing nuclei of little salt crystals. And that can produce a, a, a cloud cover that is quite intense over the tropical hot sea area. This has two effects. It reflects a lot of light back out from the Earth. It increases the albedo effect, right? So we push back the energy from the sun that is driving temperatures up. It's a great big umbrella. That'll keep it cool during the time when it would otherwise have got hotter. It also reduces the temperature of the tropical seas, and that cuts down on the energy of extreme storms. So it's as a win-win. And I think if you look at the implications of global heating for the whole storm energy and the increase in high storm 
energy surges towards the American coast, for instance, the investment in this technology is minimal compared to the damage potential if we don't do it. So here's a go-go. Now those technologies are in design form and testing form. They could be deployed. So I'm actually quite confident we can do it. Where the despair comes in is can we mobilize the will, the political decision making, the engagement of work across the world to make it happen, and the sense of literally rising to the challenge of the recognition that there now exists a state of global emergency that requires global response and collaborative work, not trying to wipe out other people so that we can grab it all for ourselves, a sort of feeding frenzy at a global level. That would be catastrophic. It would set off what we're trying to avoid. But the mobilization of a working culture, almost like on a war footing, but on a major catastrophe avoidance pattern for our whole world community. It's possible. We can do it. Mm -hmm. What kind of timetable are we looking at? That? Looking at? What, 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 mm. How big is this window we have before it's too late? I wish we knew an answer to that. This is a, where the, the science is extremely uncertain. Let's put it this way. I think we now understand the animal we're looking at. It's going to behave this way. How long it's going to take before it gets to the point where we literally run out of the capacity to make a difference is hard to say. It could be a decade, it could be two or three decades. But let's put it this way, we have to turn our whole civilization round within that window in order to make that difference. So you can't wait for the decade to say how wide's the window. You can't wait for two, two decades and then say, oh, it's now too late to act and we didn't know how wide the window was so we didn't act. We actually have to act as fast as possible knowing that we have limited time and knowing that every year we delay costs more, costs more economically, costs more in massive amounts of human lives and decreases our capacity actually to make a difference. So you say, what's the window? I say, well, there isn't one in terms of action. We have to start now. If you say, what's the window before we actually precipitate a catastrophe we can't recover from? I say, I hope we don't get there. But the answer to the first question determines whether we do or not. 